<laughs> Hello. Can you hear me? Hey, can you hear me in the back? I guess we can now. All right. Hi there. I am Lee. I publish under the name LT Ryan. I've done so since 2012. I also run a very small uh, independent press where we publish authors in various genres, especially mystery thriller. Um, and uh, I didn't realize I uh, was moderating this panel until a few days ago when I checked my emails. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to find out it was you. <laughs> I don't have any uh, presentation or anything like that available, but I do have uh, specific questions for all of us, and we also want to know any questions you guys have as we're going along. Uh, raise your hands, and we'll grab you, and we'll we'll take care of those as well. Um, next to me is Anne, and Anne. Yes, I am Anne Fontenot. I'm with Blackstone Publishing. And if you're not familiar with us, uh, Blackstone Publishing started as an audiobook company. And we recently uh, made a leap into traditional publishing. So now we are releasing print, audio, and ebook. We've been in business since 1987. I've been with the company hmm, 22 years, part of the pictures now. Um, yeah, and happy to be here. My name's Mike Bray. I'm uh, with Wolfpack Publishing. Wolfpack's a 10-year-old um, for us. I've been selling books for 12 years. In the course of our 10 years, we've published about 2,500 books. Um, we've done the Inc. 5000 deal a couple times, and Publishers of Weekly fastest growing publish publishers in the US twice. <coughs> the only competition we have is this guy. <laughs> So I was telling a few people, Michael Anderley, LMVP in publishing, as well as two or three other companies. And one of the things that's funny about Mike Bray is, you know, I, I, I was bragging in 20 books. This is like back in 2017 or so. And uh, this jack off over here comes in and mentions how he's got a thousand more books than us. And I'm like, bastard would go into my Facebook group. <laughs> and then I find out he, uh, he lives here in Vegas and then we end up becoming like best friends. <laughs> Kick this off. Um, so the first question I have, and who wants to go first? Bray. Bray. All right. <laughs> okay. So how do you feel the small and medium publishers position themselves to compete with large publishing houses, and how do we approach marketing and distribution differently than the large publishers? Well, the, the biggest advantage that we have is that we can move quick. We can fail quick. We can move on quick. It's not a tier ramp up to get a book out. Um, sorry. Uh oh. Just for the record, I don't have my phone working. <laughs> but as far as the marketing in, um, we do market heavily, and it's primarily pay per click, Facebook and Amazon. So Blackstone is kind of unique just because we started as an audiobook publisher uh, and I have been doing it, you know, for 30 years. And the reason why we took a leap into the traditional publisher is uh, publishing is because audio was becoming so competitive in the marketplace and it was really hard in getting those audio rights that we decided, let's do it all. Let's become a publishing house. Uh, so we got lucky in a sense that we already had author relationships, all the relationships within the distribution with all the partnerships. So for us, it's all about author care. And uh, obviously, you know, our audio catalog has 20,000 titles. Uh, the print is about a thousand. So we are very choosy in our projects. We believe in each one. Each team is going to read it and uh, definitely it's going to be a collaboration for us uh, on how we bring title to the marketplace and uh, the same as Bray we are very quick uh, in bringing title to the marketplace uh, and so much so because we also print on demand in-house so that gives us a lot of flexibility and we can also leverage you know the partnerships that we have in place and that we built up on audio um, you know when we want to run campaigns so get you know special placements or merchandising so definitely we rely on special projects we have brought to the marketplace uh, you know, projects from self-published uh, authors, you know, Nicholas and Sperry Smith, you know, Red Bruno, Jamie Castle, Geneva Rose, 
etc. So uh, it's all about the work and the quality of the work and what we can do together, um, yeah, to grow together. New goal, 20,000 audio books. <laughs> I think one of the things that we need to look at is it used to be that it was a very business to business for traditional publishers. They would go from their salespeople twice a year out to the bookstores. Mm -hmm. COVID shut that down. They became business uh, to consumer and they learned that really, really well, which pissed me off so much in 2020. Uh, so we have a different paradigm here. You might have noticed if you did pay-per-click advertising that 2020 and 2021, the cost went through the roof. And that's because we had a bunch of large companies who were able to come in with large budgets who didn't have a clue what they were doing, and they ran the, the costs way through the roof. They've come down now. They're starting basically May, June. Um, the costs seem to be coming down because a lot of people are coming off the euphoria of everyone reading all of the time. So we're starting to lose a lot of our readership from that perspective. Uh, a lot more competition now. I personally think that a lot of companies that made it through 2020 would have closed back then. Um, but because everyone had nothing to do, they continued on. So we have different things that we can do. If you don't have a deep catalog, narrow your focus and become really, really good in one thing. Those fans will become to know you and know you well for that. Um, someone like ours, we, we broke out of the single genre a long time ago because we would just kind of flood one particular thing and we couldn't grow. So there's a, per there's a moment in time when you have to realize that you can actually go out and do a different genre. I, I told one gentleman who's got a very um, very successful space opera kind of business, Space Marine, and what I told him is, look, if you want to grow, you need to test a book that doesn't have your name on it, put it in a different genre that's not adjacent, which means that you won't be able to easily find other customers, and see if you can actually make it go anywhere. If you can, you probably have a good chance of getting bigger. If you don't, you need to figure out how to do that. So those are my hey, thoughts. I like that because one of the reasons that I decided to start publishing other people, two reasons. One, the pandemic and I couldn't travel and I was extremely bored. And But also to see, like, I have had a lot of success as LT Ryan. It is a brand. It runs itself. Um, and I, I market heavily, but it, I can put something out and it sells. Yeah, and I wanted to see a yeah. yeah. little bit, a little bit. But I wanted to see, like, could <laughs> I do the same thing for other people? Could I build that kind of platform for somebody? Yeah. And that's really good. Um, so, Anne, since you mentioned Geneva, and you know that with a superstar that she is social media wise, I am curious as how important is the author's platform or their social media presence in your decision to publish? I would say <laughs> it's definitely a big plus. Um, and uh, if uh, it depends, I mean, it depends. I would say if an author has a big platform, um, it's part of our marketing efforts and how we can leverage that with our own platforms as well. Uh, if an author doesn't have a platform but has had some success uh, in the past, it's not gonna be, you know, negative in our decision making, if we're gonna move forward uh, with the project or not. Uh, if it's a debut and a person that doesn't have uh, a social media, we definitely have to think differently about the strategy on how to launch the book. Uh, and that means that our social media team and digital marketing team is gonna have to work a little harder to kind of build. And there are ways to build social media uh, presence. It's just require more work and how we approach the launch of a book. But it's definitely a plus because she's definitely a, a superstar. She's yeah. a superstar. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, anybody with seven hundred fifty thousand followers is yeah. and works in the way she does is brilliant. I'll yeah. be honest. We look at the social platform first, at the author's platform before we read a page. Um, we're looking for prolific authors. Um, it's, there's multiple ways to, to skin a cat, but this is a formula that works for us. We don't actually use it the same, so there's not a whole lot of business. You know, a lot of times you will see things like um, you know, M. Guida and Michael Anderley. Anytime that you see my name second, the, uh, whoever was first was the main person who wrote this, but because Michael Anderley has uh, over 100,000 names on Amazon connected to it, 
it has its own push. So the, their actual social media is a plus, but it's never really considered. It's really, do we like the books? Correct. Uh, Bray. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what are your thoughts on the future of independent bookstores and their relationships with small and medium presses? You know, we're uh, a little different. We're, we're pretty, uh, pretty niche, uh, especially in the Western genre. And the, the brick and mortar has just dropped that, um, the Westerns. So uh, it's not a big uh, move for us, although we do sell a lot of paperbacks. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's our authors are selling those. I'm not selling them. They're doing it at live events, a lot of book signings. And if you guys want to get into Barnes & Noble, go introduce yourself to the local manager. They'll take everything. If you got a relationship with that manager, yeah, it's a it for my genre. It's it's definitely a big thing because you can read a book a week, and between James Patterson and David Baldacci and every single ghost is still out there, you're never gonna I always say slip through the sewer gates and find my 5.99 books because there's plenty there. So it's it's always something that we're thinking of, and not to necessarily wade into AI waters. There are things that you can now utilize to get more data and contact these people, and it's something that we want to get established working through either a, a, a printing press to do it or doing it through Ingram to get those books ordered and get them on shelves. Because just between my top two series, it's, it's 25 books. That's full shelf that people would walk in and never see, and, and they want it. I think they do want it. I did a library event just uh, last month in McCormick, South Carolina, People go into the library buying their, you know, getting their trad books to read, and 75 people show up wanting to meet me, wanting to get a book. So they're out there, they want it, they want that content, but getting in there, getting positioned in there is, is, is so difficult. You want to take a stab at that too? Yeah, I wanted to, to weigh in on that. So, yeah, we are very gauged uh, in that market. So there are about 2,200 indie bookstores in the country. And uh, we have a dedicated sales team um, that kind of pitch our books. Uh, and we do, you know, obviously author events and try, you know, to leverage uh, those relationships. So I truly, and, and they are very demanding of, you know, programming and how you can help them as well. So uh, it is the same way as for the libraries, it takes a lot of efforts, you know, to engage with each one of them. But uh, yeah, I feel like it is, we've seen some um, stores that have opened over the last couple of years, which is really great. So we're here to support them. They do also some trade shows around the fall with author events that kind of allows us to highlight upcoming titles. So yeah, it's a great community and very happy to support them too. Cool. Michael. Bray, Michael Bray. <laughs> <laughs> um, how do you measure the success of your marketing efforts? And you know, what, uh, I lost my question, hold on. How does it influence future campaigns and how much are you release heavy versus maintaining like an evergreen kind of presence with all the releases? Over the years, um, so we have about 2,000 titles now. And so related to the question of you know, release heavy advertising and everything like that, for a certain amount of time, we were trying to advertise every single series. And then it got to be to where we had hundreds of series. And you could tell the effe efficiency of those series and how effective they were. Also, how engaged were those authors with our company? You know, I didn't set it up to say if they really don't talk to us, and we have one particular author who hasn't really talked to us since like 2017. He's like, I did it, you're gone, we tried to engage, he wouldn't, so. But we always try to do something for everyone at least once up to four times a year, minimum, on these things. We try to keep all of our costs to spend uh, about 20% or less from a marketing perspective. Um, obviously, if a series is doing really well, it might look like we're spending 8%, but that's just because Amazon's probably supporting. Once we go over 20% spend, we start finding out, is it just a situation where the advertising is not resonating? Um, is it this particular genre is, you know, what's got a problem? Um, and then also what you'll normally see is uh, an arc, and, and Bray and I have gone through the charts, but <laughs> he did it to me again. 
<laughs> so you look at the chart of a backlist, and predominantly if you look at Bookstat or something like that, the backlist is over a year old. And there's some different reasons for this. Um, but when you look at an LMVPN backlist, you find out that we are so heavy in the first part of the year, or in the first 12 months, and the reason for that isn't because we failed to sell backlists, it's because we repackaged the shit out of our backlist. So book one, book two, book three, trilogy. Book four, book five, book six, second trilogy. Now we got six books and two trilogies. Seven, eight, nine, trilogy, box set. I mean, we are constantly pushing new in there. Yeah. And that's how come our front list looks so heavy versus you know our back list situation that goes on. Is yeah. that? Yeah, I always recommend like, if you're writing in series, I always recommend get to 10. Because at 10, you've got three trilogies you've got all the individual books. If you're doing audio, you've got audio. You can bundle the audio. It gives you so much to work with. And then continue on, should you choose to. Um, yeah, that's that's pretty good. Anybody else want to hop on that one, too? Yeah. The old adage, the, the best way to market your last book is with your next book. Uh, we re rely on that a lot, and we rely a lot on uh, price pulsing. The w once a quarter um, with Amazon through KP KPD. Price pulsing? Yeah. Kindle Unlimited, taking advantage of the 99 cent and then free promotions. Okay. I got to go in for you, Ann, I think. Um, can you walk us through the typical journey of a manuscript from submission to publication with your company, especially with having your own printing press, being able to produce audio CDs in house? I'm really curious. Yes, so uh, we accept submission uh, either through an agent or directly from an author uh, that goes through a whole review process. The review process includes acquisition editors by also folks from our companies. And then uh, pretty much there's a meeting after afterwards and we decide if we want to go behind that project or not. So it's a group decision. Uh, so from there, you know, you get an offer. There's a whole negotiation in place. Uh, from there, we decide uh, when we want to schedule the book for release. And around that time, um, you know, in that meantime, you will go through a whole editing process with our team just to make sure, you know, it is the book that we want to bring to the market. What I mean by that is that um, is is there's enough um, character development? Do we feel like the end is what we expect it to be? Things like that. Um, and then uh, after that, we like to work a little further in advance just because we like to engage with all of our accounts and uh, those guys have a timeline and a calendar that we have to respect. So um, generally about a year to nine months in advance, we're going to have advanced copies and we're going to try to get blurbs. So we're going to engage with the store, um, with our key accounts, and try to create the buzz and see, you know, how engaged they're going to be in terms of pre orders, et cetera, or what placements we're going to get. Um, and then as we get closer to the launch, obviously, there's going to be plenty of meetings with the author in terms of marketing, publicity, and how we can collaborate on that front. So uh, I'm not going to get into the whole details, but it's going to be kind of your standard launch there. Um, and then once we get all the orders um, in place, uh, we go to press about four to six weeks in advance of release. And that's when everything gets shipped to the stores. Um, and uh, yeah, and then the audio, you mentioned the audio. So yeah, so the, the audio about 12 weeks prior to the pub date, generally that's when we engage with the narrator uh, and get everything produced and that go through a whole production process with post-production, etc. cetera. And uh, everything gets um, posted um, about three to four weeks prior to release. And the same way we engage with all of our accounts to uh, maximize all the opportunities that we can find with each partner, either in the trade or the library. So it's a very quick overview, but. Very <laughs> highly organized. 
hurts my ADD brain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, we're, we're in this, this landscape now that changes so fast. You know, Amazon has always been at the forefront of machine learning. Um, things change super quick. Like in 2018, if you asked me to give you a good overview on AMS and marketing, I would have withheld secrets from you. Now I would have told you how to get started, how to run a baseline, but this change is so fast now that there's not many secrets left. You know, you need a good, strong baseline. So to that, Michael, what do you think about, you know, how do small, medium publishers adapt to changing trends, things like TikTok that come up, the demands of readers, and then also, you know, dealing with our vendors and, and algorithmic changes and when something happens and, and knocks off 20% of sales for, for small presses and indies. Uh, I'll take the last one first. We've always been very focused on our cash flow to make sure that we're not caught with you know nothing in the bank, so to speak. So we're constantly making sure that as the money comes in, that we pay everybody first. I don't want their money sitting in my bank account. So right. we, um, our contracts are, I think, are like 21 days or something. But generally speaking, we pay everyone. Like if we get paid on the 30th, we're having their payments are out by the first or the second. Is rarely, you know, is typically what we do. But contractually. So anything that came in this month, we're trying to pay by third, fourth of the following month. Um, so that's just from a, a financial side of things. And I'm sorry, if I answering that question, I totally freaking lost my point. <laughs> um, yeah, the adapting market, the trends, the changes. Okay. Know. So obviously we're under the biggest change that we've all seen in publishing. You know, we can go back to the Amazon Kindle um, that was an opportunity for authors to go international, you know, through a distribution mechanism. And the, the situation is for a lot of publishers, the LMBPN operates differently. Let's just kind of clarify that. While we have published other people, we own almost 90% of our IP. That's really strategically different, and that means I've spent $10 million on ghostwriters, which I've explained to people before. So if it says created by Michael Anderley, that's a concept or beats that I've written, but I didn't write the book. So there, we have different tactics that are gonna go on. I think that right now what we're gonna end up within the next three years is the single person publishing company. One person's gonna be able to sit there and operate almost every role that's necessary in the group, and they're gonna have to make those decisions for that. Mm -hmm. um, Will we all get there? No. So the, the publishing companies that are here have to make decisions. Some of them are like, okay, here we say that word again, AI, um, is gonna have to make a decision, where do you want that to help you in the company? It might or might not be related to writing. It could say never writing, but what about editing? What about translations? What about digital narration? You know, what are these opportunities that are gonna appear to you? And the ones that are perhaps not as obvious and, and Mike and I were talking about this last weekend. I asked him the question, I said, what business person, preferably dead, would you love to have a conversation with about your business? And he goes, a name I hadn't heard in a long time, T. Boone Pickens. Are you all familiar with who he is? Yeah, there's, I see some head shakes. And so I go, okay, ChatGPT, you are Team Boone Pickens. And I just did some stuff and I, and I said, you know, you, but I want you to talk to me because I have a fiction publishing company. So the question comes in is like, if you're gonna make changes and, and different ideas, what's about, are you asking? Because you can set the AI in the mode of a certain person. If that person had enough information on the internet about how they thought, all the way up to April of 2023, they just released that, right? And you, there's an opportunity in the new release where you can set it as an agent. You can tell it what to do. You can tell it to help you look at your book from a creative writing. Are you gonna take advantage of that? Because what does that do? It allows you to be more efficient to make the decisions, whether it's a business, like the D T. Boone Pickens, or whether it's a creative decision. You're gonna be competing with people who are doing this. I, I do believe you can still, I, you know, you can be the horse and buggy, that's fine, you can. I think you'll still have some opportunities, but everybody else, the, the ability to do a minimally viable product with so-so writing is gone. Just be aware that, yes? That also might be that the system is really good. Yes, Judah said to remind everyone that the AI can help you with the negotiations. Put the legal document in there. Just ask it, where are the gotchas? 
there's a lot of good things that are going on, and the future is going to be so radically different. The question that I would give you and I would encourage you is just to be open to it and just try to keep up. I, I drank from the fire hose for the first three to four months of this year, well, December through, like, whatever, and I ended up having to shut it off for a week. My brain, which loves new stuff, was inundated with all the changes daily that it was becoming a depressing situation for me. And I had to recognize that and step back and say, look, I can't even pay attention to this for the next week. I don't know, don't care, <laughs> you know. And so there's opportunities that, that you'll do from a publishing perspective. Just realize that now is one of the best times to get in because there are going to be people that are going to not change. Don't let it be you. Um, anybody have a question? Anybody want to ask anything? I don't know if we got a bunch of hands going to go up or not, so. Yeah. It was a corporate raider in the 80s. Black hat, not white hat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure. They've asked me to ask my question one more time. Who is T. Boone Pickens? He was a corporate raider in the oil industry in the late 70s and, and early 80s. Steve Jobs. I'm like, I would like to ask Steve Jobs questions about it. So for intellectual property, how do you guys manage that? Do you own it throughout the lifetime of the author? How do you manage your ISBNs? No. Wolfpack's typical deal is seven years with a performance clause at the end. We do have some deals for life of copyright, um, but we also have some on the short term. Generally speaking, if it's somebody else, else's product, it's a seven year. Um, the, e the audio occasionally has to go outside of that because if we own, or if we have the license for a couple of years, then the audio gets sold, then we have to you know, have a stipulation about the audio being outside of that seven years. Is that accurate since you do the, right. yes. Seven Right. We have that problem too. And so, you know, you do have to worry about the audio aspect of it if you're going to do it, especially if you have a partner. That partner is expecting you to have all of your, you know, T's crossed and I's dotted related to audio and the licensing. And so you do have to pay attention to that. Um, when, it was sh when it's anything with me, we own the IP. And there's, a, there's legal aspects of it because you don't want somebody, let's say that, you, you know, it could be you, it could be LT Ryan. You know, he doesn't want to get into a contract where they have rights to his name. And so that's very specific. And so if you're going to get LT Ryan's name on your book, I guarantee you LT Ryan's got that contract forever. <laughs> oh, yeah. And even on the publishing side, there are a series that we have where I'm heavily involved with the creation, outlining, character development, and all of that. And within those, we do lifetime rights. Um, some of the other ones, we do seven years. So it just depends on how involved I am with that author developing and creating. Um, and we're, we, we have stuff where we've got three people uh, working on. You know, one of the guys that's worked with me for a long time, he's in the background on series now, um, working uh, with the writers directly. So yeah, it gets split up a little, little weird sometimes, but that's what lawyers are for. Um, might be uh, opening up a can of worms. Are y'all taking manuscripts at this conference and how many how many have you gotten so far out of the 2,000 some odd people here just curious I travel very light so I don't have room in my backpack for uh, any manuscripts <laughs> if you brought one <laughs> but anyway go ahead yeah um Generally, we like digital submissions. <laughs> it's just easier. Um, but if you have a book, we're happy to take a look if you stop by the booth. We take agented and unagented manuscripts. Um, the best way to get a hold of us is through the website. There's a submission process. Um, but bear in mind, we're looking for a minimum of trilogies, and we're looking for something that can carry on. We've got four imprints, so we're not th that worried about genres. 
Um, right now, we've closed submissions for the most part. So, you know, ours are paused, notwithstanding something that we did last year. But, um, yeah, right now, it, it's, it's an interesting time. So we are, we're looking at what we're going to want to do. So we've taken the publishing link off of our website for now. And we'll see, you know, when and if it comes back up. So I'm a self-published author. I have 32 books out in the last four years. So I write a lot of books. Now that is in romance, uh, and I am switching, as we've spoken a few times. Okay, hold on. Uh, You're in romance. Yeah. Pen name male or female? Male. Son of a bitch. But I write MM romance. <laughs> I write gay romance, so it's okay. a little different. Okay. Not, not great. I still am the minority. Okay. But the question is, I made the executive decision this year to get traditionally published. Um, it was a long internal battle that took a long time. But now I'm faced with, and, and uh, I did just sign a contract with uh, a romance, um, MM Romance publisher, and I am courting <coughs> someone else that's sitting at your table. Um, so <laughs> the question, and I, it's not just one question, it's a lot of questions. And how, do, how would you guys, as publishers, speaking to someone who is a voracious writer, say, advise me to be a good writer for you? Because, you know, I, clearly you're not going to do 12 novels in a year. Your editors will kill you. Hope Mine tries to kill me. Yeah, no, they're, they're <laughs> that. no, really? Yeah, no, not for those of us who are digital. Now, I can't speak for Blackstone. But from a digital perspective, we would absolutely look at that. I, I mean, I put out 12 books a year. My editors that I have, that I pay, can't keep up with me. So I can imagine we... We have a, a Western um, author, B.N. Rundell, who started out as a narrator. Narrated three Westerns. He decided he could do it, write them better than the people he was narrating for. He writes a book a month, and he takes home three to 400000 every year for the last four years. That's wonderful. So we're a little more traditional, <laughs> so it will be a little harder for us. But we did publish some series, uh, you know, at a clip of about four or six month intervals. So it is possible for us to do that. Every month really will be a little tough uh, with what we have currently in place. Yeah, for us, I mean, we're super flexible. Uh, a book a month is not a challenge you know when your primary sales platform is digital it's just it, it's when you're not worried about cannibalizing a print run yeah. it kind of takes the handcuffs right. off right exactly so that's yeah I think in a lot of small presses hybrid indie presses they're probably the same way about it um, no one standing so what advice would you give to an author looking to get published for the first time to start with Um, I would say, um, depending on what genre you are writing, do some homework based on the audience that you are targeting. Um, because I think a lot of decisions have to be made for you on your strategy. So, um, depending on where your audience is, for example, are you going to want to go exclusive? Are you going to want to go wide? Uh, do you want to self-publish or do you want to try the traditional? So uh, just do the homework about industry data, about what comparable authors are doing uh, and how you want to position yourself. Uh, and then attending conferences like that are just fantastic in terms of networking and learning. Um, so, I, you know, I always admire authors because I'm not able to write myself. <laughs> so it's such a level of love and I understand how much effort goes behind writing a book. So I think it's worth taking the time to see how you want to launch it and ask questions. Um, you know, I feel like there's a lot of people who are available to answer questions so you know the best strategy on how you want to enter the market with it. I'll let you in on a, on a secret. We get a lot of uns unsolicited manuscripts. If you want to set yourself apart with your submissions, include a marketing plan. 
we get maybe one or two a year. Oh, interesting. You know, when I, I really want to kind of talk to what Anna was saying a little bit, and I think that while Mike and I might say, hey, 12 books a year is not that big a deal, you know, digital, LT Ryan mentioned it, as digital publishers, we have options, but what you're going to find out with Blackstone is they're going to, they're going to go a very regimented implementation. We tend to look at things from a standpoint of book one and in, wherever in is in your, you know, one and two, one and seven, one and nine. So I think there's different strategies that a company looks at, and I think you should look at your own strategy for your name. Is it your, your name, your pen name? Doesn't really matter. What are the tactics and strategies? The gentleman who went hybrid, which is, you know, he has his own books and he's, look at, you know, he's publishing with a publisher. That is a strategy. It's a great strategy. I think there's a lot of opportunity there because you know if you're looking to manage and, and promote your name, that's a different strategy. And if you can write that fast, that's a fantastic strategy. So look at what's going on related to that, like Mike and like Ann are talking about, and do go. We had a lot of people that got names of Robin Cutler last year and when, when she, was, she was here to be able to publish that would never possibly have seen as much if they had just tried to blindly reach out because it's hard to say no to someone in your face. Um, if you're just beginning, what do you really need to have as like minimum numbers for your own email list and social media and things like that before you can start reaching out to a publisher. Uh, in our case, it was none. But you can reach out from day one. That's not required. It's a benefit. And, and something that's going to grow over time. If, if we're correct and it's successful book, successful series, all that's going to follow. We have the marketing methods. We, we know that side of it to get people from your book onto an email list, following you on social media, and buying the next book. And so that is one of the things to consider. Like, if you want to self-publish, if you want to go with a big publisher, if you want to go with a small press, what are your skills? What are you good at? How much do you want to stare at an Excel spreadsheet every day, looking at numbers? You know, when I moved all in on Kindle Unlimited and I left Facebook advertising and went all in on AMS, it got to the point that one night my wife slapped the countertop and said, if I said the effing word keyword one more time, she was leaving me because I was only talking to her because all my friends were asleep because I did it 18 hours a day until I unlocked what made it work for me. And so do you have that kind of drive to work on the business side in addition to writing? Or is writing what you just really want to do? Then, you know, which avenue is going to make that most sense for you? And there's also plenty of opportunities with your first book to grow your list. Either you give away an excerpt, or if you do audio, you have an audio sampler, you do giveaways, etc. So you just have to be, you're fully committed with that first book also to grow your list, your social media platform. So you, you have to be all in. Okay. For each of you, what would be your dream manuscript? If someone came to you and handed you something and you said, oh, that's it, what would it be? <laughs> <laughs> you know, for me, I'm a reader. That's what I like to do. And I can't express necessarily what that one manuscript would have to have, but it would have to engage me to where I'm like, no, sweetheart, I'm not going to talk to you. I'm going to read. No, I'm not going to go eat. I'm going to read. And then I realized, wait a minute, I can fucking publish this. <laughs> but the problem is, I'm going to try to push them to 20 books first. Why? Why would I do that? And the answer is because if they're not totally committed to wanting a publishing relationship, they're going to cause problems in the future. Because they're going to vacillate back and forth. So I really want the individuals that are going to be like, you know what? Give me pizza. Give me Cokes. Let me write this many books. That's what I'm happy. Please take over the business side of this. That's kind of important to me as well. We're pretty much in the same boat. Um, if you really want to turn me on with the manuscript, make it a trilogy. Send the, the first and the trilogy and tell me the, the, 
the second two are written. And what? Just take your first book and cut it in thirds. <laughs> <laughs> We're doing that right now with Michael Gear and hitting a home run, taking his big old door stoppers, splitting them into four, and it's working. Selling more paperbacks than he did when he originally published them. So I'm going to sound like a broken record, but very much like what Michael was sharing. Um, for us, it's very much about the quality of the work that's presented to us, uh, how engaging it is, and if we see the potential across all the various markets, uh, the potential, for example, for book club, for instance. Blackstone also has a film and media um, editors, so if there's an opportunity there, it's a big plus. Um, so yeah, so it's very much about the quality of what's given to us. If the author has a background, has a platform, it's definitely another big plus. But uh, it definitely starts with the manuscript and the quality of the manuscript that's given to us first. I, heard, I, I visualize when she goes, we have a film and TV, she just went, wee! Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, we want to be able to see that we can grow to 10 books, that you can get the first six done you know, in 18 months, somewhere around that kind of range, um, that it's going to definitely fit the genre, whatever the genre is, and have something unique about it, something about the characters, something about the, the design of the story, um, so that it makes it easier for us. Because I'm going to go in and... I'm going to push that book one. I'm going to put everything we have, every system, every marketing ability we have, and to get that book one ranking in the store. And if the book doesn't deliver on all those promises to make them want to buy book two, then we're just we're kind of shoveling money away if we're not getting a good sell-through rate. So that is very important, that it's going to be that, that kind of character, the kind of series that people are going to be inclined to move on to book two, three, four with. So, yeah. Anybody else have a question? Okay, you guys have any closing uh, closing thoughts, arguments here? We gonna get a little arm wrestling down at the end of the table. <laughs> <laughs> Mike's pulling out his business cards, just so you know. <laughs> While I believe it's going to be an interesting time that we're going through, don't give up. Find out what that opportunity is. When I first started, they told me that I was writing too many books and it would never sell. Ha ha, jokes on them. <laughs> And I just want to encourage everyone like, it, like we have all the times before. You know, people still want stories. They still want to be entertained. They still want to cry. They still want to, you know, take that sucker. All of those things. And there's still an opportunity out there for you. Uh, and I just want to encourage you to understand that and believe that and move forward. And don't let those that are scared who have their head in the sand stop you from just walking right by them. You know, that I've heard all of the excuses over the years of reasons why things won't work for people. And I've yet to see that every year someone else, multiple people, haven't made it big. One of the things that's really awesome is you can do all the machine learning you want, but the machine doesn't have the data, like a new genre that becomes popular that hadn't been there before, it'll never suggest it to you. So keep your eye out, it's there. Yeah, and those people he's talking about, they were there in 2012, they were there in 2011. Like, you could say it was a gold rush, but we didn't have 20 books. We didn't have anything like that. You know, we were there figuring it out as we went, learning and discovering this marketing thing. So and it you can fun. still make it. Mm -hmm. It was fun. It was fun, and it, but it still can be, and you can still make it. And tuning out negative voices to continue on that is such a huge thing in this. Yeah, and I like to add that the new generations also are avid readers. I was reading a recent article um, from ALA, the American Library Association, that was saying that about 53% of the Gen Z and millennial, millennials, if I can pronounce that word, <laughs> visited a library in the last 12 months. And, uh, and they were embracing all the formats. The one thing, they just didn't want to wait one week you know, so they were even, you know, checking out print books. So I was feeling very confident to hear that because, you know, there's, there's so much content nowadays. They have access to subscription, videos, YouTube, etc. But I'm just like, okay, 
it's great. They are readers and they want content. So um, yeah, I feel like the the future is bright for everyone. I think there's a niche for everyone. So and yeah, we all love a great story. So keep on the good work. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everybody on the panel. Thank you for coming in. Thank you for your questions. I hope this was helpful for everyone in here.